for those of you who are listening in here, um, one of the, the wonderful things about this, this universe of cloud um, natives and open source people and the community dev development people is that we're all quite willing to share our stories and, um, and help with other projects. And Tari, uh, you have been instrumental in lots of different um, arenas in OpenStack and, in, you know, and I've, I've followed a lot of the OpenStack stuff from the early days. And uh, I'm really thrilled that you're here today to, to share your lessons learned um, under what I call the big tent. Um, I think you guys coined the word or it was coined about OpenStack. Um, so I'm going to let you um, take it away and talk for as long as you like, and then we'll bring on um, a panel as well. So Harry, take it away. We're on time for a change. Perfect. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, thanks you to Diane and Daniel for the invitation. Um, it's always great to be able to share our our experience and mistakes and and good things about the OpenStack experience. Um, so my name is, is Thierry Carrez. I'm working for the OpenStack Foundation. And I've been working on OpenStack since the, the very beginning of the project. And in a month, we'll be celebrating the 10 years of the OpenStack project. So I think it's really a great time to reflect back on what happened and derive lessons from, from this adventure. From our experience, really openly developing at a massive scale. So what do I mean by openly developing at a massive scale? Well, by openly developed, I mean an open source project where anyone can participate on a level playing field, where there is no main sponsor with special rights or special access, where everything is transparent. And obviously today, there are few uh, there are a few uh, new projects that have followed the same path, but uh, most notably Kubernetes, obviously, is also an openly developed project. But back in um, 2010, when OpenStack started, it wasn't that common for new projects to be set up that way. And it's also uh, massive uh, in, in terms of uh, in 10 years, OpenStack has grown a lot, and uh, I have a few numbers to try to illustrate that. Um, we currently have 762 Git repositories, and those are all official OpenStack repositories under the stewardship of the OpenStack Technical Committee. It's basically um, all, uh, all those repositories under a single governance body. We also have uh, more than 8,000 individual contributors to OpenStack so far. And here I count uh, only code contributors, so authors of patches that have been accepted in, in OpenStack. So not just uh, uh, people that participated in the community one way or another by, by asking questions or anything. And uh, in terms of activity, we had around 48,000 changes merged over the past year. And those are Garrett changes, which are comparable to GitHub pull requests for those who are more familiar with, with GitHub as in they are reviewed by a human and tested before they are merged. So this, these are like comparable metrics. And this place is OpenStack still as one of the most active open source projects in activity today. Um, finally, in terms of deployments, uh, our OpenStack user survey reports about 10 million CPU cores of computing power running on OpenStack. Those are powering virtual machines, containers, bare metal machines, storage and, and networking resources. And that's only what's been reported to us because we also know a lot of deployments uh, that do not report exactly numbers to us. The picture on the slide is, is the, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, the European Center for Nuclear Research, which uses an OpenStack cloud with more than 300,000 CPU cores to uh, power its data processing capabilities. So overall, I would say that those 10 years have been a, a wild ride. Um, we mostly focused on handling that crazy growth. Uh, and uh, there was really a lot of yak shaving involved, especially in, uh, on the project infrastructure side where we, uh, we, quickly, we quickly hit the limits of what we started with in uh, 2010. So we started with uh, the Launchpad uh, system from, from Canonical, uh, but clearly uh, at one point we overgrew Bazaar, 
which was the, the um, code rev the code uh, revision control system. Uh, and so we switched to Git, and then from Launchpad we switched to Jenkins for running our tests to uh, Zool CI for for handling in the load that we ended up running. So there was really a lot of yak shaving involved. Uh, and at the same time, now it's really calmer, and we don't grow as fast anymore. OpenStack components are more stable. So it's really a, a good time to reflect back and extract some uh, hard-learned lessons from, from that experience and share them. Um, the, first the first lesson is that you should ignore the haters. And it's sad that it happens with open source projects, but with any reasonably successful project, there will always be a group of people that will publicly express dislike for what you're doing, for what you're trying to achieve, what you're doing, and, and trying to bring you down. And usually it's coming from people that are not really part of the project at the beginning and they feel left out. So rather than trying to join and, and participate, they prefer to, to, um, to dislike the project publicly. And uh, OpenStack has been predicted dead for the past nine years. It's been an interesting exercise, but we're still very much around. Uh, adoption is still growing like crazy. So my advice would be to ignore the people that say you're dead and, and pursue your goals because time will ultimately prove you're right. And, and uh, open source is very resilient. So um, that's really follow your, um, follow your, um, your own light and don't listen too much to people that don't like you. Um, the second lesson is that hype goes up and down. Hype is this excitement around your technology as people try to rub their heads around the, around the technology and try to understand it. So that really generates a lot of participation, a lot of press articles, massive conference attendance, and it's generally fueled by curiosity. But at one point, people start to understand the technology and what it can and cannot be used for. And at that point, hype goes down. And it's generally a painful moment because um, to support all the participation that this hype phase brings, you tend to build a lot of structure in terms of uh, event size, processes, project infrastructure, and scaling that infrastructure down to more reasonable and sustainable levels can be difficult, especially if you are uh, engaged in, in uh, multiple years ahead. And another aspect to that is that the open source project in itself is not a business model. And uh, companies getting involved with the project actually need a real business model. So a lot of companies, mostly vendors, tend to join the project early on in hope that it will magically make them relevant in the 21st century without having a clear business model in mind. And when they fail to magically extract money from the project, they readjust their investments, they jump to the next thing, or they completely drop from the game. And at that point, when hype goes down and companies pull out resources, a lot of people will leave your community and you have to be strong and resilient. What you, what you soon realize is that at the end of the day, you're actually okay as long as you have users. Users is really what ultimately matters because they will be self-sustaining at some point. And so past that depression, if you stick to the project, you realize that boring is good. Uh, turns out once you remove all the hype, infrastructure software is kind of boring and uh, hype can be very toxic. There used to be a time uh, where OpenStack would sell press articles, clickbait headlines, um, and, and people would watch our every move, uh, read our every word on mailing list posts and try to extract drama that wasn't really there. And that, that was a lot, that was very stressful. And now we're in a much saner environment with a lot less external pressure. And uh, we also got rid of poisonous people that, that got attracted by hype and glory at some point. So I would say we're in a better position now in terms of community health than we were maybe four or five years ago. Um, an important follow-up lesson is that at the peak of the hype, it's easy to get into an echo chamber and think that your tech solution is the end to all things. 
that it will solve all problems forever. I've seen it happen with OpenStack. I'm now seeing it happen with Kubernetes in a way. Uh, turns out you're not the last thing. There will always be another technology that will come next and steal the hype. And you have to prepare for that. And um, when that something else comes, it's important to realize that they don't replace you. Uh, technology is really additive. People like to think that one technology can be used for everything, that it can replace everything. Learn it and you will never need to learn anything else. Uh, sell it and you will, it will just solve all of your customers' problems forever. But reality is more complex. Containers did not replace virtual machines, which did not replace bare metal machines. Functions will not replace containers. Unikernels will not replace functions. Technology is additive. Um, and as we add those technologies, integration becomes the real challenge. And that's why it's so important to engage beyond your community. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do here by sharing our experience. Uh, at peak hype, there is a tendency to think that everything should be absorbed and done inside a single community and ignore all the other communities. Engaging beyond gives you perspective. It avoids you getting stuck into an echo chamber. It allows you to learn from history, learn from the mistakes of others or their good experiences. It reduces the risk to repeat the same mistakes. Uh, and that's why I'm here today, to try to share lessons from, uh, from the OpenStack experience. Another lesson, uh, important lesson, is that being massive does not prevent you from being fragile. When you have thousands of contributors, like OpenStack has and Kubernetes has, uh, it's easy to think that your community is stronger than it really is. And fact is, you actually rely on the work of a very, very limited number of highly engaged contributors that take on strategic contributions and critical functions, what we call horizontal work in OpenStack or what the Kubernetes community calls shop wood carry water. Um, I made this graph a couple of years ago to illustrate that. It's it, a graph showing the number of developers necessary to produce a given percentage of the changes in the, in the OpenStack release. So on that release, we had about 2,500 contributors, which sounds like a huge number. Uh, but obviously, there is a long tail of very small contributors. So you can see that it takes about 500 developers to uh, produce 85% of the changes. But more interestingly, 50% of the code is produced by just 93 key contributors. That's actually a lot more brittle than the thousands numbers that I started with. And that thousands number can make you believe that you know, you're invincible, you, you, nothing can happen to your community. But the reality is um, you will rely on the work of a, of a lot smaller number of contributors. And that's because some roles are just hard to fill. Um, you, there are multiple reasons for that. Uh, first, organizations tend to do tactical contributions. They tend to invest in things that benefits them in particular like adding a feature they need or fixing a bug that would only affect them. And you need people to do strategic contributions, things that will benefit everyone, like handling release management or fixing a complex bug that affects everyone. A second reason is that at the peak of the hype, certain functions are really hard to fill. Um, developers tend to be kings and they have the luxury to choose. So they generally pick things that are less boring and more creative, which generally leaves a number of roles to be filled. And finally, some functions are just requiring significant uh, expertise that is different from that of the crowd, like technical writing or UI design. And it's sometimes hard to find resources to fill those or to attract them in your community. The next lesson is that over time, people will join. Uh, one error we made early on was to assume that our principles and our culture would naturally transmit to newcomers through uh, oral tradition. 
And that worked to an extent, but at one point it stopped working. And we realized that we should have documented our culture rather than just assume that it would naturally transfer to people that join. The mirror lesson uh, from like people will join is that over time people will leave. And life happens. I mean, you, you can't expect your small, small circle of leaders to stay forever. And at that point, you need to have a bench of other people ready to step up. You need to train them to understand that they will be stewards rather than kings, that they have, will have duties rather than rights. And you need to provide multiple opportunities to step up and give proper recognition to those who do. And I think that's an area where the Kubernetes community did a really great job with uh, the shadows system that allow you to grow leaders uh, in the shadow of existing leaders. And I think it's a really great model to, um, to emulate. Another issue we encountered uh, is how we scale development itself. In OpenStack, we split development across project teams that are dedicated to specific components. And in those, there would be core reviewers, which would be uh, basically people that who, um, who approve the changes ultimately. But those people can't review everything. So they basically have to trust each other to review changes like they would have reviewed them. And turns out that works until the group reaches a certain size, which is around 16 people. You can't really scale up trust. You have to scale it out by uh, further splitting code areas. And that can really be difficult when people don't want to let go of uh, their ownership over a specific area. And that's just one way Conway's law will bite, bite you. Um, Conway's law states that organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of those organizations. So basically, do your uh, you, you put, what you produce is completely uh, predetermined by how you organize things internally. And in OpenStack, we organized development around project teams specialized in specific components, which made it hard to do cross-project horizontal work. Uh, and it's harder to track that kind of work, it's harder to do, and it's not well recognized. So as projects got more stable, it started biting us because um, we wanted the various components to work better together. And so we needed, we needed a lot of that consistency work to be done. And, and that, that work is much more difficult than it should be. So it's important to be aware of that. Another way Conway's law will bite you is that due to the way the open source project is organized, everything our community developed was put in the same bucket and called OpenStack. And now we realize that it's sending a pretty confusing message. People are still asking us, what is OpenStack today? And, and it also made it difficult to discover uh, components that can be used standalone without any other OpenStack components. So we've started recognizing that uh, and make it easier to discover and reuse individual components within the OpenStack framework. We also um, started to work on other open infrastructure technologies and try not to call everything OpenStack because that's one point it, it, it's more confusing that help, than helping. Um, so having seen a few of those uh, openly developed, massive openly developed projects now, there are a few axioms that seem to apply every time and I thought it would be useful to try to uh, uh, list them. So the first axiom is that you have to have four opens for it to be really an open collaboration. Um, the first open is open source, which is an obvious first one. Uh, using an uh, open source initiative approved license and not supporting open core models is pretty important if you want to build a healthy community. Open development is the second one. Um, everything happening in development should be transparent and accessible to everyone. But that's pretty standard in, in 2020, especially with uh, GitHub that helps setting up projects uh, in a pretty open way. Uh, open design is a step beyond that. 
design should not be done behind closed doors by a separate group of privileged developers. It should be done in the open and be inclusive of users. That's really critical. And finally, the last open is open community. Any individual should be able to join the community and become a leader. Um, contribution should be your only currency. Nobody should have special rights based on who they happen to work for. Those four opens are the key to a successful and healthy open collaboration. Open collaborations have a hidden secret, which is that openly collaborating has a cost. You will go slower and um, a focused startup will get to something working in a fraction of the time it will take for an open collaboration to get there. So you have to accept that. You have to accept to go slower because you will also go farther, which is for software what ultimately matters. Um, another, sorry. Another hidden secret of open collaboration is that uh, open collaboration will inevitably lead to scoop creep. The reason is it's really difficult to say no in an open collaboration. Someone comes up with a feature to support a corner case and brings it to the commons, it's really difficult to reject it. So you end up usually with lots of options, lots of plugins, lots of things that are beyond your scope. So it's, it, it, you should try to put barriers in place to resist that, uh, like an early manifesto that will say what your project is and what your project is not, that you can easily refer to afterwards. Because once the, the open collaboration is in place, it's really difficult to, to resist. Um, as engineers, we like to gather data and measure performance to try to improve. And as humans, we like to see how we compare to each other. So that's usually why we derive stats and metrics to follow our development efforts. And we put up websites which present those metrics. Um, the, the problem is it usually incentivizes gaming the stats and results in the wrong behaviors. Uh, the good art slow states that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. So basically, if you if you start publishing the metrics and people start to compare each other using those metrics, then it, the metrics go bad. And it's a difficult one to fix. In OpenStack, we try to avoid it completely by not providing such uh, competitive metrics at all. But then someone else built the website that allowed people to compare to each other. That's, um, that's really um, a problem. It resulted in, in like uh, people submitting patches for for typos everywhere to try to boost their standing. And um, it, I don't have like a, a great solution for that. Uh, the last axiom is that face-to-face -face time is necessary. And I know we are running a virtual event here. And as much as I would personally like us to be truly globally distributed, some things require spending some time together in person, like uh, building trust, building shared understandings, solving hard problems, agreeing on priorities. Uh, we, the OpenStack Foundation, run our first virtual developer gatherings two weeks ago. And it's sort of, it's, it sort of worked uh, as a sync point for the various teams, but it did not generate any long-term alignment or shared understanding. So something was missing. I think it's, it's great that we can have those virtual events. Um, it allows people to to, um, that cannot travel usually to your events to participate. It's good to have them. But at the same time, if you only rely on virtual events, you will lack the, the necessary trust building to, uh, to make uh, few fully online communities completely um, healthy and, and uh, sustainable. Um, okay, so last part of this talk is about giving a set of best practices that uh, sh should be able to be applied to any openly developed open source project if you want to start with a with a good base. Uh, my first advice would be to start with a, by documenting a clear set of principles. 
Open source projects are ultimately social beasts. People are joining a community, uh, not necessarily a technology. So setting a number of principles in stone from day zero will really help set expectations and build a common culture. Uh, you, in terms of project governance, uh, I have two rules to follow that I advise people to follow, which is to add governance structures only at levels where final decisions are needed. Um, there shouldn't be any vanity uh, governance bodies because that, that's not very helpful and that creates a lot of uh, churn in the community. Um, but you should add enough structures to strongly align with your constituencies. So if you have completely separate groups, they should be completely uh, represented by different governance bodies. A lot of projects just start with the BDFL model, uh, but to me that's, that's an anti-feature. Uh, the BDFL model is basically a cargo culted non-governance. Um, so sooner or later, you will, you will need proper governance. And the more you wait, the more painful the change will be. Um, diversity is critical, um, and we already had a few talks about it today. Um, it's critical to build a healthy community, to have enough different perspectives in a community. And it starts with inclusive community processes and tooling. Uh, as an example, when OpenStack started, it was mostly between US and Europe-based developers. So we relied heavily on weekly IRC meetings in a European and America-friendly time zone, which made it pretty difficult to contribute efficiently from China or India. And so my advice would be to build from, for the fact that Earth is not flat and, for example, reduce dependency on synchronous meetings as much as possible. And more generally, you should make sure that uh, your processes and tuning are not actively excluding minority groups. Uh, because if, if those, those tuning is, are put in place by the majority group, obviously they can be very excluding. I said earlier that as long as you have users, you're good. But uh, users don't appear from nowhere. You have to cultivate them if you want them to be part of your community. Getting users engaged and actively participating in the feedback loop is essential. Um, but it's important also to not build a, a developer versus user mentality. One mistake we made early on in OpenStack is to have separate governance representation for developers and users. I feel like it prevented users from uh, being more naturally involved with um, with the developers in the, in the, and 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 participating in that feedback loop. It can be pretty difficult to unwind uh, as time goes on. Code reviews are now pretty common, um, but you should also adopt uh, test-driven code getting. Basically, prevent code from merging if um, uh, changes do not pass tests. So from, from day zero in OpenStack, we had that saying that if it's not tested, it's broken. And the truth is, in any complex system, if untested things are not broken already, they will soon be broken. So I think it's important to assume that if you don't test things, they're they can very well be broken. Um, adopting code getting like we did in, in OpenStack has a lot of side benefits, um, like the development branch is always usable and it promotes a test-centric culture that is really good. Um, I would also strongly encourage adopting time-based releases um, over feature-based releases. I feel like it's, it's becoming pretty obvious now that um, it helps because uh, in a truly openly developed project, you will ha really have a hard time predicting what and when features will land. So rather than doing a bad job at feature-based releasing, you should embrace the benefits of time-based releases, which is to have a predictable cycle, clear planned down downtime for your community, uh, happy downstream users knowing where their work, when their work starts, and events that can be well synchronized with your development cycle. Embrace time-based releases rather than do a, a bad job at feature-based releases. 
And finally, um, my last advice would be to uh, automate everything you can automate. This has plenty of benefits. I mean, automation will obviously save you a lot of time, uh, avoid a lot of human error, and ensure repeatable processes. But beyond that, automatable tasks are usually boring. And um, so for your community, people will prefer to work on automating those tasks rather than do them over and over again. So in OpenStack, we ended up automating everything, uh, even things that don't really make sense automating, like uh, our IRC meeting calendar or, or our, the, our world what is process is completely automated. But it really pays off in the end in terms of making sure that all those, uh, those boring tasks are, are covered. And that's it. That concludes this talk. So thanks for uh, watching this. And I think we can open to the panel for questions. Absolutely. Terry, thank you very much for this amazing talk. I think everybody's been chatting amongst themselves here in, the, in there mm -hmm. and just going, there are so many things that we all learned and are still learning from the OpenStack Foundation and the work that you guys have done. And I really can't thank you enough for um, making uh, this actually happen. So here, I'm just going to unmute a bunch of people who I, I think you all recognize and know. Um, I should have everybody unmuted. Rain and Amy Merrick and Lisa Marie uh, and Daniel Esquerdo and myself. And I can see sort of the top of your head in that picture, but in your eyeballs. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> it's there you go. It went to my other uh, webcam for some reason. There you go. Hello. Uh, and it's, 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 it's the rule of the hoodies here. So uh, I, I'm liking this uh, this day today. So I, uh, we're getting a whole bunch of hoodies going on here. Uh, Terry, you said a ton of things um, that were incredibly useful uh, um, and think lessons that uh, I think a lot of them, uh, since most of us are also working and collaborating with the CNCF um, and the Kubernetes community, um, we also um, have, we all, a lot of us came from the OpenStack community into the Kubernetes and there's still a lot of collaboration and work that goes on between. But we um, we really are, are grateful for for you sharing this experience, you know, your experience, and um, continuing to work um, and collaborate with everybody. So thank you. Um, that said, um, I have Daniel, Rain, and Lisa Marie and Amy here. Um, I'm sure they all have comments on this, um, but I'm going to just say right off the bat, my the golden rule is that you put down for me is if it's not tested, it's broken. So um, I think that should be tattooed on every every open source project uh, thing. So and thank thank you for that one. Well, it's uh, actually I Monty. A poster made. Of course, yeah. it's Monty. I, I, yeah, <laughs> it's not me. Sorry. <laughs> but can it's we well get through one top and out a Monty shout out? I guess we can't. <laughs> <laughs> OpenStack still has to have at least one Monty Taylor shout out. Hi, Monster. We miss you. So I think one of one of the things that is also really interesting to me about the OpenStack uh, world is um, how you are now reinventing yourselves with open infrastructure. And one of the lessons that you learned was like pulling everything under the big tent or the big skirt and labeling it OpenStack. And and it's nice to see that the CNCF hasn't hasn't done the same thing completely. Um, but can you talk a little bit about the, the reinvention and I think it was Starlinks and some of the other projects that you're pulling in and how how that's informing where you're going next. Yeah, so it started by realizing that um, trying to market a number of things. I mean, the, how we ended up there is because we had we had uh, OpenStack, the OpenStack community, and the reason behind the, the the big tent approach was, I mean, everyone that is part of our community is participating in OpenStack. It was it was the, the idea that we should be a very inclusive community, and you know, who are we to decide with who is part of our community and who is not part of our community? So anything that the OpenStack community produced ended up being called OpenStack, and obviously that's not that pretty poor product management. <laughs> so because in the end you end up with something that 
uh, is called OpenStack, but it has so many facets. Um, and and uh, at one point, it, I mean, I understand why we ended up this way, but at one point it started to be more destructive when we started to explain what OpenStack is in, in clear terms, uh, to have more of a brand rather than a product. And so um, we realized that, especially once uh, some of the components that we produced were um, equally applying to Kubernetes and OpenStack, for example, didn't it make any sense to call that OpenStack. So Airship, for example, um, is, a pro is, a, is a deployment project and they can deploy OpenStack, but they can also deploy other infrastructure stacks. So making it a part of OpenStack makes it extremely difficult to explain. It's easier to explain that it's a deployment system that can deploy OpenStack. Uh, in the same way, we had uh, Zool, the Zool CI, uh, which, which was mentioned in, in, in the talk, um, is also something that was born out of the OpenStack infrastructure, uh, but generally useful to others. And so if we just call it a part of OpenStack infrastructure and don't give it its own brand or identity, it's really difficult to to, uh, to explain that um, to to newcomers that might be interested in Zool without being interested in OpenStack. So um, at that point, we realized that what we what really matters is is not necessarily the technology that you produce, but the people that you assembled to work on those problems. And OpenStack as a community is more of a community of people that integrate various pieces of infrastructure, open source infrastructure software. And they will combine OpenStack, but also Ceph or Kubernetes or others to uh, provide infrastructure for others to build their, their, their applications on. And so what happens in OpenStack summits, for example, was more a, a gathering of operators of open infrastructure solutions. And as they were discussing new projects, new pieces of software, it made more it made really apparent that the real gain for us was to um, provide this environment where people can discuss open infrastructure in general and um, rather than just OpenStack and work on the complex problems which are integration rather than and operations rather than just discuss uh, like development of OpenStack. And that's where the, the flip switched in my head. Like, we are not about producing OpenStack. We are about helping people operate open infrastructure. And so we can do that by helping, obviously producing OpenStack, but also producing other pieces of software, discussing integration with other communities and not just the pieces of software that we produce. And uh, that's where the, the, the extension came. We're a community of humans solving a problem space, not just producing a certain piece of software or a certain uh, brand. And if I, can I jump in here for a second? Um, from a community standpoint, we, uh, I remember when this discussion was starting to happen and I feel like as community managers, we really pushed the envelope on that one because the conversation sometimes starts in the community before it actually gets to the foundations, right? And it should be that way. And um, But I really have to applaud the OpenStack Foundation for listening because we had we changed the name of, of our community. We used to be just you know, OpenStack. We changed it to Open Infrastructure and then it became Cloud Native Open Infrastructure. And, it's, you know, and we started doing that, I think, years before the actual summit changed its name because that's the conversation that the community wanted to have. And we, you know, we still did OpenStack stuff. We ran the first ever Zool meetup and we ran the first ever Kata Containers meetup. And we still really tried to push the technology when it was required. But it became more talking about solutions. The community was was users, was contributors, was ops, was architects. It was a whole bunch of different people who were coming, and they wanted to talk about complete solutions and and really solving a lot of business problems. So we had already done that, and by we I mean the San Francisco Bay Area chapter. Um, and I really have to applaud the the foundation for taking the feedback and um, and for listening and for then changing the name of the summit to to really help us. Um, you know, kind of mirror the community. Yeah, I totally agree that it's based on the feedback of the community that we ended up um, seeing that, as, at least from the development side of the community. Clearly, uh, that's the 
around the time where we were in that echo chamber that I described in, in the talk where you don't, you, you on, only hear about OpenStack, everything, your world is all OpenStack and you, you, you're you blind to, to what happens elsewhere. And, um, and so it was really useful. The community really helped bringing that external perspective, especially um, operators in general, like uh, having to operate those stacks of software, they didn't care about like who produces it, you know? What they want is the, the resulting stack to work. And um, so rather than discuss only one piece of technology in, in a vacuum, it's much more useful to discuss integration of the various pieces and solving real problems rather than uh, be a bit territorial about what you what you end up accepting to discuss and or not. Yeah, that's like the Ops Meetup team. They put on twice yearly events and they're mainly focused around OpenStack and operators, but they're including Ceph and they're opening it up to other things in order to meet the needs of the operators and again, that complete solution. So, okay, we need a bigger, more robust storage. Ceph fills the need and a lot of people are using it. So why not include it in the operator meetups? Yeah, I always I always thought of OpenStack as an umbrella project anyway um, that included a bunch of specific projects that came together to make something work. So switching it 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 made complete sense. I I I was involved with Lisa Marie's um, group before Open Infrastructure changed its name as well, and I was like, that does make sense. And so when when OpenStack Foundation changed to Open Infrastructure, I was like, yeah, duh. Um, it, it just made complete sense. Um, I'm wondering if the OpenStack Foundation, like the, the foundation part of it, is going to change to something like Open Infrastructure Foundation or something else in the future, or if that's in the pipeline. Well, that, that's definitely something that's being discussed. I would say that in order to justify that, we would need to um, I would, I would say we, we don't have enough technology or new technology or new members to actually justify that at the moment. OpenStack is still like the, the, main, uh, the main product. But if we uh, ask people, like, like, like you said, uh, understand what we're trying to achieve when we, when we talk about open infrastructure, uh, there will be more potential for other organizations to join with other pieces of technology that are not connected to OpenStack in particular, but are still used to provide infrastructure using open source solutions. And um, at that point, I think it would it would make more sense. Um, but I want to rename just for the sake of renaming. I think it's good that we renamed the summits. I think it's good that we renamed the the, the events. But um, I would say for renaming the foundation, we would. I think it's important to it would be a new chapter and to justify the new chapter, it would need significant change. I don't want to change it and not add anything, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> so that, yeah, that would be my, that would be my guess. And from the community standpoint, I got to say, people do not care what it's called. I mean, they, honestly, <laughs> you yeah. can call it anything you want. Yeah, well, the, the name you, of the foundation yeah, is sure. not really important. If you look at the PTG, it was going to be the Open Dev Plus PTG. Now that's been separated into two different events, but the open dev part is scale and edge and so many different topics than what would be covered during the PTG, which was very OpenStack specific. So inviting other groups to come and talk has definitely been where the OSF is going. You know, anything that is infrastructure, if it touches on OpenStack, great, but if it's just a neighboring community, you know, OSF has been very open to inviting them to events. And I'm actually looking really ex excited. I've signed up for two of the three so far, you know, and just hearing what other people have to say and how those other communities interact with us. Yeah, we've, we've been trying to, to um, invite as many like uh, adjacent communities to to our events, especially the, the project team gathering, because it, it allows uh, developers to, like they had their own meeting, 
but they can mingle with with developers from the other communities and that kind of uh, uh, osmosis between the between the groups is is really interesting it's it's difficult to do without like being accused of of you know stealing other communities but um, I feel like developers don't care <laughs> I mean rain has been to a number of PTGs and we've seen uh, we've seen uh, uh, Ceph we've seen uh, other like other containers but also uh, uh, Tungsten Fabric and other groups joining because there was significant overlap in their in their interests and and just having them there, having them around was really useful to to bridge uh, bridge the gap between the, between the, between the communities and and discuss potential integration points and in the end the software works better if if things uh, if we exchange more and so um, I feel like it's it's the right approach to invite everyone. On, and, and if we have to take some heat about it, fine. Yeah, definitely easier when we were face, but I'm really looking forward to the open dev because we will at least get the mix there where we didn't have the virtual PTG. And so yes, I can, Speaking of, go, go ahead, Lisa. Lisa Marie. Well, I was just gonna bring up um, something he mentioned earlier. Um, in the in your presentation where you were talking about that contribution is your and that everybody you know is part of the community if um, uh, if you know you're contributing so I want to point out that Amy I spent a lot of time talking about this um, when you say contributing you're not just talking about writing code there are lots of ways to contribute to a community and people sometimes forget that and there's so many, yeah, there's so many important roles to play. And a lot of people get really intimidated about joining and staying in communities if they're not actually programmers working on a project. I mean, Doc was pointed out earlier, you know, the community will let you know where the gaps in your project are. Doc is often a gap, but there's so many other, um, what was the name of the group, Amy? The, the AUG, the, or the ATC, the ATC what, I can't even remember the acronym, but, um, but in OpenStack, we went and did create a, a user community, a, a group of active contributors that aren't actually code. And it was called non-code contributors. There, there's bias in that statement right there, and we had to call it something else. Um, and so the active user community goes well beyond people who are just developers. So I want to make that point so that everybody understands they have a role to play in community, an important one. One of my favorite parts. Yeah, you keep circling back around to that, um, that end user community and the importance of that in any of our communities or ecosystems and recognizing their contribution. So I think that's a real key point, Lisa Marie, thanks. Yeah, and it's actually the dark side of GitOps is that once you turn everything into a Git repository, then everything is measured against uh, changes that you produce. And if you don't, if your work does not translate into a change, uh, then then you don't exist. And and that's uh, that's really the dark side of of automating everything like we did in OpenStack or driving everything through Git and in others is that if you don't get out of your way to also count all those other contributions that are really key to uh, having a, a full perspective on what's happening, it's difficult. And you mentioned the, the AUC criteria, which is basically having a number of rules to recognize, automatically recognize contributors uh, that have participated in in those non-measurable ways. Like, uh, um, so if you moderate a session at, at an ops meetup, you should you shouldn't even have to has, ask for uh, to be added to to the group. It should be given to you because we all we all know that if humans have to ask for things, they just don't necessarily do it. So having a way to list all those forms of contributions that that should automatically be recognized, even if you don't have a script that will automatically compute the list for you, is I think a good step that we we put in place in a, in OpenStack. And it's really easy for a developer-centric community to just like ignore that. And I'm talking from the I'm a, I'm an offender of of that in the early years. I'm just in the light later. <laughs> yeah, I, I, actually it's. Interesting. This I mentioned it earlier today. I'm working on a, a COVID-19 initiative with a bunch of data scientists and data scouts and people finding open data sources to use for mapping COVID up here in Canada. And um, 
what it's kind of the square peg in the round hole thing because they have a website and the website uses GitLab so they have the Git centric stuff but none of the data scientists or the data people who are, are looking at they're all clinicians and data scientists and we're trying to force fit, feed them um, GitLab and Git processes um, and it's you know and, and we're going to do it you know we're not stopping we are going to use it so uh, yeah, this is just the nature of the beast that we live in but it, it's been interesting to listen um, today and, and hear how um, maybe not all of our automation and our uh, processes work for all all things and there might be some things that we need to go so it's all good well it's like in OpenStack and we offered it to other parts of the community under OSF is first contact SIG. You know, a group of people who are going to help you get started in the community. OpenStack Upstream Institute. You know, live hand holding and help for two days right before summit or at some of the OpenStack days or now infrastructure days. So the community providing people who are going to help you is so important because for someone who doesn't know your processes, like we use Garrett. I love Garrett over PRs. But most people don't know Garrett or how to install it or anything else. So having people there who are willing to take their time to help you contribute your first patch is awesome. And more and more groups yeah. are doing it. Amy, I have to give a shout out. Amy has done a phenomenal job building a mentoring program. This is another valuable part of a community. The, um, the mentoring program in, um, in OpenStack and, and beyond that she's worked on for years. And, um, you know, these are thankless jobs. And as Tilki was saying, you don't always get the credit. So as community organizers out there, it's super important to really think about these things and then to figure out how you can recognize those members of the community. Another thing I would say is quite often the, the community developers, managers, and the people organizing all these things aren't recognized. Um, unless they're doing some sort of, you know, documentation or something like that. So it's like you might go and work on a project uh, like OpenStack or one of the many other ones and never make an engineering contribution. So you never do that. So it's also interesting. I, I, I have some qualms about the um, the gamifying, the badge, the badging. Uh, in, we use it a lot in Fedora, um, Fedora badges and stuff like that. So I... I've never been a huge fan of it. Do you guys feel like that that actually works? Is that something that people are incentivized by it? I always feel like it's gamifying thing. Just personal opinion. So I love gaming and so I love that, but I completely see your point of view to 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 kind of there's a certain rejection of gamification unless you are a gamer type you know, or unless you fit in those holes to earn those badges. And I and I get that. Um, I I think the only badges I have in Fedora are time based from having made my account and then still being a member. And then I then I happen to have cake with uh, with the last F cake. And so I have a cake badge. And otherwise, it's not real. Everything else I've done for Fedora is around advocacy work and diversity work that doesn't have a corresponding badge or gamification or award. And it's not that I wouldn't have done that stuff. It's just that it's it's very difficult to recognize advocacy specifically i think that's something we should change let's let's do something around that right there even in the oui sessions people have gotten their companies to send them places early and they just sit in the room well we started saying whoever answers this question gets a tim tam people started answering questions here's a sticker you know so gamification can get participation and in those instances it's really good but when it's for a company or someone to just say, we've got the most commits, we've got the most that, then it's not a realistic application of a gaming because you're gaming numbers to your benefit, not gaming to help the community, if that makes sense. Yeah, I also think I'm not so much worried about, I mean, we've all seen people gaming systems um, at, and stack analytics and other, you know, everything. And, and I'm the first to say that I love metrics, I love dashboards, 
I, I love the insights they give me um, into what's going on in the community and who's doing what, but they're not the full picture. And I think my point is more about um, that the things that we can measure, we do, um, but the things that are not quantifiable, um, we, we kind of leave off the map. Um, and, and one of them is like DevRel or Dev Advocacy. And often what I see is a little bit of, um, then those folks ha tend to have, or us tend to have uh, imposter syndrome. Like we may do a career for 10, 15 years in this, but we never made an engineering contribution. So when we, you know, go to whatever, we don't have that, you know, the badge of honor or something like that. So I'm, I'm not so much worried about people gaming the system. People know that happens, right? Um, people are, have been in enough of these things. So I think that's, that's one of the things that, that I am, I'm always cognizant of is that all of the other participants in the community, how do they get, how do we recognize them? Um, and, you know, we're able to, in, you know, let people flag themselves as end users using a production, giving them the podium, sharing that. But um, it's really, I think, one of the more difficult tasks in community building is making everybody feel like that their contribution counts and get that, um, you know, especially because of everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people work for companies that value the contribution label. So um, I think that's something that's we still we still haven't quite fi figured out yet. Yeah, I mean, it is hard to yeah. recognize people. And, and like Tom Fifield actually did have a script that would go through on the AUCs to some degree. But then it was also reaching out. And every time I, it was reached out to me from either the Women Open Stack and later the Diversity and Inclusion Working Group, I always provided names of people who came, showed up, and did something, not just said hello in a meeting, you know. Um, you came and helped out at something, you deserve AUC. You know, you helped run the mentoring program, you got AUC. So it's got to be a two-way street where the community is asking the people who know in the working groups and the SIGs who may not be showing up, even the technical contributors. There's an extra tech ATC status here, you'll know the correct name for it. But like before docs was considered a technical contribution. This was a way of the doc contributors getting recognized. So there are ways of doing it, um, but the communities also have to be open to it and be able to supply the information. Yeah. And it's not just about being recognized, because one of the things that the, the Open Stack Foundation did, and, and you know, we brought this all the way up to the board, but they listened, um, was they, they started giving this passes to the conferences and scholarships, if, because the problem is a lot of times if you're managing a community or you know, you're doing that on your nights and weekends, um, I, somebody has, Tomeo had a slide about that. A lot of us are not doing, like when I was working at HP, I was never paid to run the OpenStack community and I was running the world's largest <laughs> OpenStack community twice a month in the evenings, you know, just it's all personal time. And I'd written two books on OpenStack and I still wasn't considered, you know, a contributor. The foundation listened and they started giving us passes to the conference and, and in some cases, because I was never getting paid to be sent there, they were, you know, doing some airfare and things like that and I really thank them for that. And we did get our little um, AUC on the badge, our little sticker, and it really meant a lot, you know, to be walking around the conference with that imposter syndrome thing hanging over your head, you know, to actually be, no, oh, I'm legitimate. I have a legitimate reason to be here in this community. It meant a lot. So that's one thing that um, foundations can do. Yeah, yeah I, think I think the key is to is to uh, judge engagement rather than you know the, the, the end result. Like if someone engages. And, and participates in the community, they should be considered a contributor and also apply very liberally the like the, the rule, not not try to restrict it to to a, an elite group because otherwise that 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 way lies madness. <laughs> and so uh, yeah. like we use the ex we use the extra ATC to to um, for all the translators, for example, if you submitted a translation, it should count as a contribution and. And so that's one of the mechanisms we, we put in place to, to uh, that wasn't a Git contribution, but it, it definitely required a human typing names in a, in a, in a list. But it requires some work to properly track contribution in community. 
So sometimes it's so much easier to just like rely on Git logs and, you know, don't ask questions. Yeah, I, I know uh, that Daniel and I, who have been doing uh, some work on, um, he mentioned it earlier today, it's, it's one thing to collect the metrics, but if you don't have uh, a domain expert or someone who knows the community to apply the metadata or to the understanding of what they're doing in the community, it's, it's a two-part two um, measuring and uh, collection of data and information. So that's always pretty significant. Well, we are a little over our time um, and our next guest speaker has, has come. And so um, I really, Terry, again, I'm gonna keep saying this, um, all of you who are on this call, Amy, I'm so glad you're, you're with us at Red Hat because I am so gonna take you on as a commons person to um, help us build out a lot of our um, end user and other parts of our community. So it's wonderful to have you here. Rain, uh, you just departed Red Hat, so good luck at Packet. Thank you so much. And Lisa Marie, I can't tell you how much um, I respect the work that you've done in the OpenStack community. So thank you again for all of that. Um, and um, I'm definitely gonna have all of you back on for other variations on this theme soon. So thanks, thanks again um, for your work and your efforts and, and Terry, I'm going to figure out your lighting situation because you look the healthiest of all of I us. Know, with right? That color lighting. Look at all you. I'm so like, jealous. I'm really <laughs> jealous here. So anyway. Yeah, and Diane, thank you for everything you do. It's not easy what you've done. You have created an incredible community with OpenShift gathering and the conferences that you put on. And it's I've been honored to participate in, I think, five or six of them. They are really amazing. So thank you for all the work you do. We'll keep on yes. trucking and we'll be doing more of it and reinventing it.